In the past few years, the City of London, financial services, have contributed a third of all our economic growth. London is the capital of capital. London for the international community is a beautiful city. A lot of people are living in London that they might find interesting to meet. It's got the restaurants, it's got the clubs, it's got the bars, it's got the decent hotels, it's got the nice houses. It's safe, it's secure. There's a lot going for it. More than 50 billionaires call Britain home. Not since the 19th century have there been such opportunities for so many to make quite so much money. At least 30,000 Brits now earn more than half a million pounds a year. In 2006, 4,200 city executives took a bonus of a million or more. And among hedge funds alone, 150 people have been earning more than 20 million pounds a year. The only other period we have seen similar accumulation was during the Industrial Revolution in the Victorian age when the whole raft of Victorian industrialists uh, made massive fortunes very quickly but even that was over a period of 40 or 50 years. This has been in the last 10 years. When you're coming here with several billion pounds, you travel around in armoured limos guarded by people who look after you. The idea of the congestion charge is wonderful to you because it clears the roads of the riffraff. You can get out to a private airfield quickly to get on your jet to go and see far-flung operations as part of your empire. And they've created ghettos of fabulously expensive property. This house in North London recently sold for £50 million. The new owner will be spending probably another up to £30 million creating what will probably be the most desirable house in the world. And just outside London is this brand new 26 bedroom mansion. It's on the market now for over £70 million but it's the running costs of over a million a year that means only proper billionaires need bother to view it. Even so, the developer, Leslie Allen Verco, tried his best with me. So this is the private swimming pool, is it simply for the owner of the house? Unless, of course, the owner of the house wants to allow people to use it. The ensuite swimming pool why would you want five pools? Because you've got five pools, haven't you, in this house? What family needs five pools? You genuinely need to like swimming. This bathroom area is about 800 square feet. Putting it into perspective is about the size of the average two-bedroom flat in London. That's just for your towels, that room, is it? I feel rather disappointed I haven't got one of those. It's the size of a decent-sized kitchen for me. It is. <laughs> Jewel-encrusted gold tabs. That's very good, very nice. Definitely going to have to have one of these in my home. So how have all these people become super rich in such a short time? Unlike the past, it's not been about finding new resources or exploiting new technology. The answer lies in how they've conjured with money itself. And they were helped to become wealthy beyond anyone's wildest dreams by a sharp fall in the cost of money for them and all of us, engineered by the US Federal Reserve. It sets interest rates for America and, in a way, for the world. A clear September day. The American economy was already faltering after the bursting of the dot-com bubble, and then... The world's most powerful central banker, Alan Greenspan, feared the terrorist outrage would further undermine the confidence of businesses and consumers, so he kept interest rates unusually low. 
American interest rates were tonight cut by a half of 1%. The Federal Reserve's base rate now stands at just one and a quarter percent, the lowest for 41 years. After the bursting of the dot-com bubble and 9-11, Greenspan slashed rates to just 1%. And the supply of credit soared because the great exporting nations, such as Japan, China and those of the Middle East, were generating vast surpluses and lent much of their cash to us in the West. Finance is global, so it became cheap to borrow money anywhere. For private individuals, and especially for businesses, tycoons and financial institutions. They went on the most frenetic borrowing spree the world has seen. With so much money sloshing around, the price of assets, from paintings to houses to entire companies, soared. So People borrowed more against the inflated value of their assets. The valuation of property, the valuation of shares, art, jewellery, etc., was soaring. And the central banks on the whole said, this is not our business. We don't manage assets. We only manage price inflation. With markets rising, borrowing vast sums for investment was the route to magnificent fortunes. It's what bankers call using leverage. Leverage is simply borrowing to invest. You're not investing your own money. Uh, or you're investing part of your own money, but you borrow to invest more. Um, so that's simply, that's, leverage is borrowing to invest. When we borrow for a mortgage, we're leveraging. As simple as that. The power of leverage to multiply profits is a common experience for millions of us who borrow to buy a house. If you put down a £10,000 deposit, when buying a £100,000 home and borrow the other £90,000 and that house then rises in value to say £110,000, well, your £10,000 doubles to £20,000. You make 100% profit. That's the magic of using the bank's money to finance most of the purchase. And in a rising market, the more you borrow, the greater your profits. The level of debt that became available for deals became very, very high. And what was really uncomfortable was that not only was it a high level of debt, but every passing month you could get more and more debt. With debt so cheap, deal makers were borrowing mind-boggling amounts to invest in financial markets, in property and in commodities, or to buy entire companies. Banks were willing to lend on multiples that they'd never known before. The past five, six years have been unprecedented in terms of cheap debt, quite frankly. And have we benefited, benefited from that? Absolutely. You know, I would rather be lucky than clever every time. Um, so we'll take every bit of luck that's going our way. And for Tom Hunter, Britain was a pretty good place to be. Because since 1997, Labour has tried to make the United Kingdom a land fit for the new super rich. Well, I think, first of all, you've got, you've got to thank your lucky stars if you are an economy which has the vibrant and successful industries known before. The past five, six years have been unprecedented in terms of cheap debt, quite frankly. And have we benefited, benefited from that? Absolutely. You know, I would rather be lucky than clever every time. Um, so we'll take every bit of luck that's going our way. And for Tom Hunter, Britain was a pretty good place to be. Because, since 1997, Labour has tried to make the United Kingdom a land fit for the new super-rich. Well, I think, first of all, you've got, you've got to thank your lucky stars if you are an economy which has the vibrant and successful industries to a disproportionate degree, because you know, that is generating wealth that you can do something with. So it's better to have the wealth generated that you can do something with than not have the wealth generated at all. 
There was a time, however, when our Prime Minister was explicitly hostile to the idea that tax rules should favour the super-rich. The Chancellor and the Labour Treasury will not permit tax reliefs to millionaires in offshore havens. We will end a situation where millionaires can pay no tax. But in government, Gordon Brown changed his mind. Labour feared that the super-rich would flee Britain if they had to pay the same rate of tax as the rest of us. And if enabling them to stay meant a widening in the gap between the super-rich and the rest of us, well, Gordon Brown believed that was a price worth paying for the benefits that might accrue. We want the best people in the world to come here because the spin-off and the clusters and the multiplier effect of them building businesses within our country is phenomenal. And why not have the best in the world right here? We've had the extreme case, there are um, people in my industry who have literally lived in the country more than 40 years and claim to be non-domiciled and pay very little tax. Now that seems to me, both politically and e indeed at some danger of the word morally, uh, fairly repugnant. Even some of the super-rich began to question whether it's fair that they should be taxed at lower rates than their servants. There's lots of things about my industry I don't like, quite frankly. But I think that, broadly speaking, and I'm speaking personally now, not for my industry, the concept that hedge fund managers pay a lower tax rate on earned income than, uh, you know, maids that clean their office, I think is just palpably absurd. By the start of the 21st century, these two factors, the power of leverage and low taxes for enterprise, gave birth to a new set of business superpowers. Among them are the private equity firms who borrow huge sums of money to buy whole companies. Private equity has demonstrated that if you go into uh, situations uh, in the company sector with uh, clarity of purpose, uh, strong drive, determination, a readiness to pay people incentives to do the difficult things, you can make big returns. And again, you make big returns, particularly when there's lots of cheap money around the place. And the fact that their, their success was over-amplified and magnified by the uh, macroeconomic environment they were operating in, which uh, made them very lucky, uh, and, and uh, I suspect made some of the rest of us rather jealous. Some of Britain's best-known businesses have been taken over and sold on by private equity for billions in profits. They include the AA, Saga, Homebase and Travelodge. The technique used by private equity of buying companies with borrowed money is also employed by Philip Green. He owns much of the British High Street. I think we probably own about 12. Dorothy Perkins, Topshop, Burton, Wallace, Topman, VHS. That's a nice, nice piece of real estate, isn't it? We actually own that. It's probably worth in excess of 200 million. Sir Philip and his family pocketed a 1.2 billion pound dividend in 2005, the equivalent of the pay of 54,000 British workers on average earnings. And there was no tax to pay on it here because it was received by his tax exile wife, Lady Green had an extraordinary period of economic growth and confidence. This, this is the, the critical factor, sentiment. Confidence was very high. The masters of the universe seemed to be getting it right. They had been producing extraordinarily high profits, great returns from their private equity funds. It hasn't just been private equity making billions out of borrowed money. Hedge funds have become the largest dealers in shares and securities across the globe. They make their money by betting on price variations, however small, between what they can buy and how much they can sell for. And they too use borrowed money and leverage to generate spectacular profits. Private equity will take control of a company. Hedge funds will trade a company. It's a very different, they'll trade the shares of a company. So it's a very, it is a very different uh, beast.